The killer stars Michael Fassbender as a meticulous hitman caught up in a tale of revenge. After Mank, this is director David Fincher's return to murder, suspense, and intrigue, so let's see if he nails his target. Welcome everyone to The Collector's Cut, I am Peter and I'm joined as always by David. It's amazing how physically exhausting it can be to do nothing. Welcome to the show, everyone. This is a movie podcast. We are working through the works of David Fincher, and this is not going right at the end because of just where it's fell in the in the release schedule. There's still two other David Fincher movies to come after this, uh, that yep. being Mank and... Uh, Gone Girl? Yes. There you there go. You. That's the one. Uh, but we've done the rest of the films before now, and this is going to be David Fincher's new release of The Killer. Uh, which just came out, and we will start spoiler-free, of course. We'll give you a warning before we get into spoilers. Uh, before we get started, though, I'll just, you know, if you enjoy the show, hit the like button. It helps out a lot if you do. More people will find the show. And, of course, you can support all the content over at patreon.com slash TV. I'll tell you more about all the extra stuff you can get there at the end of the show. But, uh, well, please, please hit the buttons. Thank you. So, The Killer, starring Michael mm. Fassbender, David Fincher's new film about a hitman. Uh, it's based on a book, I think. Uh, yeah, it's a comic. A comic. Oh, a graphic it? novel. Oh, ooh, very, very fancy. Uh, <laughs> so, obviously, Michael Fassbender has got a bit of a stink on him for us right now because just earlier this month on Patreon, <laughs> we did a review of The Snowman, which he was in. So, it was hard not to get PTSD when I, <laughs> when I looked at that man's eyes yeah. on this movie. Not his fault, admittedly, but... Uh, figured I'd mention that. Uh, you've, you've also got Tilda Swinton in here, uh, and maybe some other faces you may or may not recognize, but that is the, the, the headline sort of names. Mm -hmm. So we'll get into it. Uh, the basic gist of the movie is that Michael Fassbender plays a hitman who is simply credited as the killer. He has many aliases in the, the movie, but you never really learn his real identity, I would say. Right. So he is just the killer. And he has got a big job in Paris, which doesn't go exactly as planned and that sets off a sequence of events which leads him sort of going up against everyone in the hitman network that uh is going up the food chain so uh i'll leave it there and we'll get into spoilers in a little bit but uh i will simply ask david the question what did you think of the killer i think that the killer is boring as hell <laughs> which is I, I i was trying to think of a better way to say that but frankly that's it and the issue is not the idea that there isn't a lot of like interesting things happening i think each scene is constructed very well i think it does a great job of setting up this idea of like you know basically what's the sort of thing that's going through like john wick's mind sort of stuff where he's setting up all this like oh he's thinking ahead these like 50 moves like all those cool things but the story overall is not a story. I I sat with this movie for like three hours afterwards trying to figure out what the theme was, what this overarching message I'm supposed to get out of this movie, and I can't come up with a damn thing. So I think that it was a lot of flash, but not a lot of bang. My, my. Uh, I'm actually a little relieved because... yeah. Like, there's moments that I like. I think the direction's solid, you know, in mm -hmm. certain moments, you know, as you're going through, there's definitely moments of David Fincher flexing his muscles and showing what he can do with the camera and all that. That yeah. stuff is pretty solid. There's there's very specific sequences that I kind of enjoyed. But quite early on, I, I had this feeling that it wasn't working for me. There's a lot of inner monologue. There's a lot of narration from Fassbender talking about what he's mm -hmm. doing. And... As it was going, and especially once things... And I thought as it was coming out of the opening act, I was like, oh, maybe this is starting to get more interesting. Maybe I'm going to get into this now. And then yeah. it proceeded to get even more boring. And I, th <laughs> I think I was worried as I was watching it, especially in the back half when I realized I just I don't think I'm really into this at all. I don't hate it, but I just don't like it either. Right. And I was worried because when I looked up after the movie, what the general consensus was, I was reading some different opinions... There seems mm -hmm. to be two camps. There's this is shallow and kind of boring and is not up there with any of David Fincher's better movies, which is clearly where we're kind of falling yeah. into. 
And then mm-hmm. there's a lot of people who love it because they think it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Not in a so bad it's good ah. way. They think there's a lot of intentional comedy. And I'm, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that. I'm, I think there is intentional comedy. I just don't think it worked for me. I, I don't think the tone and the way it was presented, like, I get what the jokes are supposed to be. You know, he mm-hmm. says in his head, oh, it takes, you know, f- it'll take five minutes for this person to die because of this, this, and that, and he'll, he'll bring up statistics and numbers, and he'll explain the science behind it, and then the person yeah. he's looking at will just die instantly. And I get that that's supposed to be kind of funny, but to be honest, I very rarely even cracked a smile whilst I was watching this. And I think part of it is that it still got that really oppressive David Fincher tone, even though it's mm-hmm. telling the story of like, because I think the, the the main idea of this movie is effectively okay, we're doing a hitman in a, a world that's got a hitman network, kind of John Wick esque, but they're not as good as the movies make them look. He makes mistakes. Yeah. The people around them make mistakes, and showing that incompetence is part of what the movie is. But in his head, he always thinks he's the badass. He always thinks he's this perfect, mm-hmm. uh, methodical tactician. But, you know, it goes tits up and that's where the, the comedy yeah. comes from. In theory, I, on paper, I understand why people are saying it's funny. I did not laugh once the entire movie. I was bored. In the second <laughs> half of this, I was struggling to pay attention. I really wanted to just yeah. look away. I saw a lot of praise for a fight scene and it's it's not right. Yeah, it's fine. But it's not, yeah. it didn't stick out to me as being, you know, memorable. It's, it's Yeah, it's a harsh scene. It, it does some creative things, but... I don't think that I'm going to walk away and say, oh, you get top 10 fight scenes of all time, the killer. No, it's, yeah, no. It's, it's, it's okay. This ain't, this ain't the hallway scene from Old Boy. This ain't, yeah. you know, pick another example. It's, it's... This ain't any hallway scene ever. <laughs> like most hallway scenes are above this. Um, it's weird, though, you're saying that people find this funny throughout because I agree. I think there are little spats where it's supposed to be, an, you know, an ironic line or a cut supposed to be funny, but. Mm. I think that to say it's funny throughout is just half the tone of the movie just doesn't match that at all. What? I can't think of any, like there's long sequences of this movie where I don't think it's ever supposed to even be dancing near the concept of funny. But I, I do wonder, cause yeah. like I can see what, what he might be going for in terms of the tone and like the reason why it's funny is because it is taking itself so seriously. But mm yeah there's just something about it this doesn't click with me like i just i wasn't finding things funny i wasn't like without getting into any spoilers i'll just say the the entire first 20 minutes builds up to effectively a punchline mm. and i i just i kind of went oh, okay i guess that's where we're going with this <laughs> and i just I, yeah. I, I, never, I never i never thought it was funny and i think some of the dialogue or i should say monologue uh, <laughs> is <sighs> Like, some of the lines just come off really try-hard to me. Uh, and again, like, it's trying to be funny. There's a line in the opening where dead serious Michael Fassbender, who's doing an American accent this entire time, and he's only so-so at it, uh, there's a moment where he says, Popeye, the sailor, said it best. I am mm. what I am. And I'm like, I can't tell if that's the lamest line of dialogue someone's put in a movie, because that I, I was almost cringing when he said that. Yeah, it's pretty close. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and again that's one of those things where it does just because of the tone i don't see that as comedic there's no way that because of what's going on in the scene no it has i can to, that, see that that line has to be intentionally or it has to be an attempt at humor it has to be i want to i want to throw to you real quick the tagline from the poster of this movie which i think is perfect that's a great, that's a great tagline yeah execution is everything (laughs) and if this was trying to make this comedic if this was trying to make those little lines funny i think the execution failed i think i don't know if it's that they've miscast the actor for this role or Mm. if david fincher was the wrong person to direct because I, I don't know what the comic books the comic book might actually nail this tone it might nail yeah, this, this humor that, it, that it's kind of going for for me it was like, and there's weird references you know i mentioned popeye there there's a line later on he's got like a storage like unit that he goes in and he's got like guns and passports and all the things that hitman mm-hmm. has in storage and he's like i often wonder if one day when the automatic payments stop happening if they'll do an episode of storage wars and what they'll find 
in my storage locker. And I'm like, this, this is such an absurdly specific reference you're making right now. You know what it reminded me of the most? It actually reminded me of the first act of Fight Club with the narrator just mm. going through all of his stuff. And he points out these but absurdities. But slower, like much, much slower. drawn out for yes, a long time. But he's, he's pointing out these like absurdities of modern living. He's pointing out like, oh yeah, here's the way that we were born and raised and blah, blah, blah. And it is comedic. It is funny in a way that's dry and it is basically observational humor to an extent. And I think that it kind of works there because A, it is faster paced, but B, because it's this stuff that everyone can relate to. It was observations about just the world at large at that point. This, he's making comments about how droll and boring it is to be a hitman most of the time. And then he just keeps going on about like, life philosophies of like oh is if you think there are good people in the world i gotta ask you why do you think that like i don't i can't relate to that i'm not <laughs> able to see the humor to, in to, it's you had the most exciting job i could possibly imagine and you're saying how boring it is well i'm okay with that part I, and, and i'm okay with the concept that he's really up himself right if that's the joke mm. of the character is that he thinks he's this expert assassin but he is a screw up. He makes mistakes, and he he's it's constantly showing up in his work. Yeah. I I can see the potential in that. I just don't think it works in this movie with this performance, with this dialogue, with this mm -hmm. tone. Uh, the the entire opening twenty minutes is him in Paris, effectively just waiting and like you know just just watching a building, waiting for the right people to come in and out. He goes to get breakfast at McDonald's at one point, and for some reason takes the bread off like a maniac. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Which, okay. If you want to show me a character's a sociopath, you have to disassemble a McDonald's sandwich. <laughs> That's how it is. But even when he goes to the McDonald's, he's like, there's 15,000 McDonald's in France. And mm. uh, it's the, if you want, you know, 10 grams of protein for two euros, it's the best place to. And I'm like, what is this? That like, he just keeps talking. It sounds, and I get, I get, again, I get the point as the character is up his own ass. But mm -hmm. after like, two minutes of hearing him talk and this is when he's still in one room he's not even left a room like the first five minutes are him doing yoga and just sitting in a chair right yeah. narrating when he's in there narrating and he's talking about philosophy and not caring having to be detached i'm like oh my god i hate this this is this dialogue this monologue is so up like the writer's own arse i i yeah. I, I hate it like th this is not engaging like and the sad part is is that I think there's a version of this that I would love. Like this like quiet, minimalist film where it's a hitman just waiting for his target and we're sort of in his head as he's going through like all the things he's doing and the meticulous nature of it. But so much of the fluff that he's actually talking about is just inane and makes it all feel so shallow that I... I, I don't want to use the word hate yeah. because I don't think it's terrible. But no, it's it, it was not working for me. I was not into it. I'm sad to say. <laughs> that's i mean that's exactly where i'm at as well though you do bring up the point i actually think this a lot when it comes to movies with monologues i think that blade runner was the first time that i heard it talked about of mm. how much better can movies be made if you just remove the monologues you just let the character sit in silence and you show whatever they're feeling visually and i do think fincher has the talent that I might have been able to get the point of the story, get what was going on just visually. So I'm actually curious how this would play out if I just wasn't listening to the character the whole time for that first 20 minutes. Yeah, I would probably enjoy that. I mean, I I, I do think there's a version of the narration that could work, but mm. I, I do, you know, it, it makes me think of Better Call Saul. There's all these scenes in Better Call Saul where Mike will have a plan and he's doing something and he won't say what it is, he'll just quietly do it. And your mind's mm. kind of like try to follow it and sort of, and as it happens and as he's setting up, you figure out what he's doing and there's like a eureka moment. And I could see that happening with this type of thing. It's like, okay, he's watching mm -hmm. this window. Why is it? And by the time he pulls out a sniper rifle, you're like, oh, he's going to assassinate someone. Maybe I had an inkling that he was going that way. But of course, yeah. by the time it happens in this movie, he's yammered on about uh being detached and not caring about people and there's no such thing as luck there's no such thing tyler as tyler durden 2.0 that's my main thing it here. is yeah it's watered down. and i don't like fight club and this is mm -hmm. watered down tyler durden yeah 
there's a point in there where he specifically makes and I, I feel like this is supposed to be arc of the movie sort of words and that I was trying to wrestle with in terms of theme, but he makes the point of you're either one of the many or you're one of the few. And he sees himself as one of the few. He sees himself as someone who's able to stay above everyone else. And like you're saying, up his own ass the whole time. But the movie doesn't do anything with that. The movie does absolutely nothing. And at the end, he, he, he says the line again, but slightly different. And that's why I think it's supposed to be the arc, but like, I don't get it. I don't see that in this movie. No, the actual climax, because you're talking about like the, the, the very end, the epilogue, mm -hmm. which is literally called the epilogue because it has chapter yes. titles. Uh, but the, the conclusion to the main part of the story actually left me annoyed and baffled because I didn't understand mm -hmm. why he didn't just do something. I was like, wait, wait, yeah. why, why, why? Why is it happening this way? I didn't get it. And I still don't get it. And we'll get into it all that spoilers. Like it's it feels like it's supposed to be some sort of character evolution, but nothing in this movie informs me that the character is evolving in any meaningful way. It, it, this, honestly, this movie to me is a, a perfect example of all style and no substance. But while there's cases where the style can be enough if you keep things simple enough, this mm -hmm. movie somehow dodges actually just telling a simple character story. Yeah. Because it effectively becomes a revenge story, but... the. The, the, the thing that he's getting revenge for is so poorly developed and barely introduced that literally the dog in John Wick has more character development than yeah. the, the the person that he's supposed to be getting revenge for in this. It's... it's oh. I, I'm pretty sure if I didn't have subtitles on, I wouldn't know the person he's getting revenge for's name. Yeah, That's no, I agree with that. the only reason that it was notable for me. Oh, dear. Yeah. I, oh God, that's... This was sad. That's, yeah. I, I, I hate that, you know, because we were pretty down. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that because the, the episode's not out yet. Um, <laughs> you have no idea how we feel about uh, an upcoming David Fincher film. Do not pretend that no you idea. do. No idea. No um, idea. But just in case you infer this as us being negative on Gone Girl, Gone Girl's very good. So it's not Gone Girl that mm -hmm. I'm alluding to and not liking. <laughs> we have two films that we need to review, and one of them is good. <laughs> but it does make your inferences there it does bum me out though that now that's this is two in a row that are thinker middling at best yeah um yeah it's it's weird i feel like this movie's more in the genre of what i want david fincher to be making i just think it's mm -hmm. hollow yeah i i really wish i knew anything about the original comic to just make a comparison because apparently much like a certain other movie this is a passion project for fincher this is something mm -hmm. that he's wanted to make for years and years and it's just kind of been sitting on the back burner i have to imagine if he's that passionate about it that it must be following to the comic to some extent but maybe this is just one of those things that works so much better as a comic as a medium where you know it's up to the reader to determine how fast paced things are how how slowly we can move and we get these sort of chapter breaks that feel more reasonable rather than this one which is basically we've worked up to the movie came to a dead stop and now we're just starting again yeah and it's, it's honestly it's kind of repetitive it's basically he goes mm -hmm. to a location he has to find someone probably kill them rinse repeat that, that's yep. that's the movie like I, like there's not much more to it than that and also, I do kind of blame John Wick for this, um, but I I did look at the cast list before we got into, like, I've watched the movie, mm -hmm. and seeing there be six different people named The Blank on this cast, I, I immediately just, in my mind, put up a little barrier of like, oh, we're doing this, we're doing this pretentious thing where the characters all have these roles, but we never get their names. The same way that John Wick did. I mean, that so. doesn't bother me, and it's been a thing since before John Wick. It's it just, does, but like, but that's the other thing is like in David Fincher's Fight Club, we had the narrator who never got a name, and I feel like it's just recycling these things that I've seen time and time again, but they were done so much better there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> spoilers <laughs> then, I guess for yeah for uh actually something felt off to me right at the start because even in the opening title sequence which looks fine yes. it felt rushed to me like it was speeding through the names i'm like i'm sorry are you rushed for tv time here like you're you're whiffing through these names like no tomorrow this opening sequence felt like 
Dexter on crack. <laughs> like it was like all the same shots that you would expect from the Dexter intro, but it's playing at 400 times speed. It, I, I thought something was wrong to begin with, but then <sighs> the movie started playing after that. So guess not. Do you know what? Make C Hall in this role. I, I can see it almost working. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'd love to see him here because <laughs> he's able to pull off that sort of dry... Like, am I being funny? Is this just a straightforward <laughs> sentence? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe Fastbender. I don't think it's the whole problem, but I do think maybe he was miscast in this role a little bit. Mm. He's a bit too just dry and straight for I think it to work. Yeah, um, he's a very serious actor. It's hard to see him do like a more comedic line like that. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think it was very funny. He's not a funny man. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Uh, so yeah, spoilers. Just in case, uh, just to reiterate yes. that we're at spoilers now. Uh, you have been warned. So yeah, the opening like twenty minutes of the movie is him in a. It's a building that's uh, still being like renovated or or built or whatever. You know, it's like a floor that's unfinished. There's there's, mm-hmm. there's not much there. He's just sitting there with a heater. He's watching out the window. And he narrates a lot. He narrates while he has something to eat. He narrates while he's cleaning something, while he's prepping a weapon, while he's doing whatever. Uh, he goes on a trip for breakfast in the morning, gets some McDonald's, does some more watching. It, it's, it's a lot of this. He calls up somebody on the phone that we don't know who, but we find out that he's already been here for like a week watching this window, mm. and the guy has not shown. But of course, he eventually is going to show. Uh, there's like a tense moment where, um, like someone's coming to the door and he like he's he's got his sniper rifle out, so he's like, oh shit, I can't really like pretend this is anything else. So mm-hmm. I guess I'm going to shoot this person. And it turns out to be someone dropping off mail, so they don't actually come in. They just kind of open the door a little bit and throw the mail in and walk back yeah. out. And it's like, okay, okay, pay attention. Uh, once once he's actually sort of building up to killing someone, and like we see the target, we see this rich man who's been he's been paid to kill, and mm-hmm. he's got a well, there's a woman who goes into a room and then comes back out dressed as a dominatrix. And I went, okay, well, I mean, maybe we're going to see something interesting at least. I was going to say, you, you say dressed as a dominatrix. I think she's just a straight dominatrix. I think she was hired to be here. Oh, yeah, I, I get that. I, I'm, 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 I'm saying in the thought process of watching, I just see a woman and they're very like polite. I mean, you don't hear it. It's mm. from a distance, but they're shaking yeah. hands. They kiss each other on the cheek. And then she comes out and, you know, black leather yeah. and gloves and she's got like a paddle i think um and basically fastbender goes to shoot the guy but the dominatrix steps in front of the shot at the last second and she gets shot instead and the guy gets mm-hmm. blood all over him and of course the security team all start jumping to action and uh, i mean this next few minutes is actually one of my favorite sections of the movie just because yeah. oh i actually enjoyed his escape attempt where he has to sort of get out of the building get to his moped um just you know get rid of all of his evidence in various different places he's got you know he, he throws something in the water he throws something in the mm-hmm. back of a, a garbage truck he thought you know he, he's going through and doing all I, this stuff i do think it is also worth noting that during his unending monologue at the beginning he does make reference to the fact that everyone that he's ever targeted has been killed like he has he is batting a thousand as he says the only thing that was kind of out of his controls one of his targets died of like a heart attack before he could get to him but he still counts that as a win so this yeah. is the first time that he has actually messed up i'll be honest i line. don't know if i believe him oh yeah i'm not sure if i believe him <laughs> either but everyone else seems to treat him like he's so hot that i i guess it's true i see no reason as to why they would lie about it sure i actually think this could end up being a very short summary of the plot because when you actually just say what happens it's much quicker than the movie does it because the movie takes you just covered 20 minutes in like two yeah the movie takes so much time with all these details of him like locking his door he he basically thinks because he's botched this job he notices this guy in the plane with blue Mm. striped socks and he sees him again at the airport and it freaks him out enough to like cancel his flight he sort of gives his ticket in for for the you know the this what do you call it the Mm. people who are waiting for you know uh, standby standby he gives it to standby Mm. basically um and gets a, a room at the hotel at the airport for the night and he like locks the door and he sets a little like sound trap in case someone comes in and then mm-hmm. he leaves in the morning and gets on a plane seemingly with no so so all the tension that he might have been followed didn't really amount to anything 
I mean, I was enjoying yeah. it well enough in the moment of him like being concerned about it, but it mm. actually turned out to really matter. But he gets back to where his hideout is, which is uh, the Dominican Republic. That's where he lives. Yep. He's got a big fancy house. He drives back to there, and he's got a security gate. And when he gets to the security gate, he notices someone's been smoking in his footprints. And he's like, "Wait a minute, someone's been here that's not supposed to be." Mm-hmm. So he gets out his gun from the car, and he, he and I'm I'm still into it. Yeah, this entire sequence from him shooting the lady to now, high tension, still into this whole thing. Yeah, it's a solid fifteen minutes of pretty good stuff right it's Mm -hmm. it's exciting enough and you're like okay we're going to start to learn who this guy is we're going to get context for all these things and when he finally gets to his big fancy house obviously the the hitman business has paid him well and -hmm. he gets in and there's like some blood smeared around and he sees some broken glass and he's like oh something's happened and he he starts to make a phone call smash cut he arrives at the hospital and there's this woman in a hospital bed and her brother is like agitated and he's like nervous to see him and he's like hey you know like she's she's holding on she's, she's she's doing what she can but this is scary and we get from the context of the conversation that this woman is his girlfriend or wife you know whatever their relationship is right which is that like it, as you said it's a revenge plot like the whole thing is that she's been hurt but like we don't even know the relationship here no they don't even give that much and i think that is bare minimum to give an emotional connection to say how do you know this person who is she <sighs> like i think building up to it by him finding the blood at the, the you know the, the now empty house is mm-hmm. a good way to build intrigue of like okay who is this what's going on like but like they do so little with her like he stays at the hospital for like a day and she wakes up and she has maybe like half a dozen lines of dialogue which all basically sum up yeah. to they tortured me to find out where you were and i told them nothing killer i told them nothing like you taught me she just says killer she doesn't even know his name <laughs> so like that's your one moment of humanity if you can even mm-hmm. call it that before he just yeah. starts hunting because the one bit of information he knows is that a taxi cab a green taxi cab drove mm. whoever was here whatever two people came and tortured her away so the movie it's now about hunting them, hunting the person who like told him where he lives, and hunting the who hired him, which is the person who hired him for the initial job, because it's like mm. a covering your tracks thing. Okay, he failed to hit the target, so so the paper trail doesn't come back to me. Have some other hitmen take out the original hitman so that he can't be questioned about his involvement in the attempted assassination of whoever this important rich man was. Right despite the fact that i don't think fastbender because the entire movie is him trying to find out who the original client is it's not like he he ever could have gotten back (laughs) yeah um so but everything i just said there it's him looking for one person he finds them Mm -hmm. he does a bit of a plan to get to them whether that's infiltrating with a disguise or sneaking in somewhere and then he talks to them for a bit they're kind of scared he kills them he does it again he does it again. That that's that's the movie. I'm gonna make a comparison real quick, and I want you to tell me whether or not you get it. Okay. The Martian. This movie does a whole lot of walking you through the setup of we know what we have to do. How are we going to get there? And it shows each and every step in a way that it's like, okay, we're thinking through this. We're showing you how this happens. And then the next problem comes up and we do it all again. Okay. I get the comparison, Mm -hmm. but the Martian has a character. (laughs) It has a character with fears that you root for, that you want to see succeed. Also, the things he's explaining are actually quite interesting. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. It also has other characters that we cut to. There's a lot of heart in the Martian is what I'm saying. Oh, no. I like the Martian far more than this, but I'm saying it has the same sort of like flow to it in terms of how the movie is built for a lot of it except Mm. the martian like you said occasionally takes the scene to say hey by the way these are humans they have feelings yeah yeah although i will say i think the difference is though just just forgetting all the other things the martian is doing to make it a you know a movie that has characters (laughs) and emotions and feelings and all these other things is it just on this particular detail that you're comparing between them, which is the meticulous, okay, problem rises up, although in this movie it's just, person needs to be killed. That's every problem. Yeah. But, and then he explains how he's going to do it. The problem is, is that in The Martian, he stays on topic and talks about actually thinking through the problem and solving it, and okay, this is how I'm going to do it. In mm. this movie, he'll intersperse that 
but a lot of it will be sprinkled in with his weird hitman philosophy. Yeah. That is, that's just lame. I'm sorry. It's just lame. No, you're right. There's, there's one point towards the end where he, it's someone in like a taxi cab or something like that. And he's, he just stops everything in terms of what he's doing. He points out the guy. He's like, I don't think that guy's a part of Mossad, but he's definitely not part of Mensa. Good luck on the wordle today, buddy. I'm like, what are we doing? (laughs) <laughs> this is the last guy this is like you I... going up against the big bad and you just calling this guy out for doing the wordle do you know it says something that i do not remember this line at all which tells you how much i was just tuning out what he was saying by that point yeah. in the movie because that's quite late on uh he he looks for the the basically he goes to the cab company he makes mm-hmm. it like a robbery just so he can look through who went to his house so he tracks down the cabbie, who he ends up killing, which I thought was a bit vicious, because uh, this this guy is not yeah. guilty of anything. He just he just drove a cab where he was paid to drive a cab to. I thought it was vicious in the moment, but I was like, okay, we're pointing out that this guy is just going to kill everyone attached to this, which makes the ending all the more goddamn frustrating. Yes, the ending's really weird because there's one person he chooses not to kill, mm-hmm. and that that's very strange when it gets there because it feels yep. like he deserved it more than this cab driver did. But you know, yep. Uh, so that leads to like the two people so th- oh, yeah. yeah the cab driver says it was two people and he gives the roughest description of one of them is like a big freaking like <laughs> hey, brute to be fair when he said the q-tip for the other one i was like that's tilda swinton oh absolutely <laughs> like I knew immediately he was talking about there's it. no one else could be it's like oh yeah i'm the tall slender one with white hair it's like oh hey <laughs> what do that could be um admittedly if i didn't know tilda swinton was in this i don't know if i jumped to tilda swinton i might though i might i don't think it's out of the realm of possibility so i mean anybody could dye their hair and just be tall and slender but as soon as you look at the cast list you're like no 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 there you are well anyone you're the q-tip anyone can lose weight i don't think anyone can just make themselves taller that's fair (laughs) i'm about to say some like really barbaric like stretching devices maybe <laughs> everyone's just wearing platform shoes for the movie okay it's the best thing to kill in oh dear i, so, I, did, I did love a detail early on actually is that michael fassbender says he based his look when he's on a job on a, a german tourist because mm-hmm. no one wants to talk to a german tourist i mean I'm, fair I, I have never heard this in my life but okay i the only critique I'll give it is that in every shot that he's in, and this is probably just to give some level of contrast, but every shot he's in in Paris, he's wearing a white, like, jacket and white hat, whereas mm. every other person in the crowds is wearing black or dark grays. And I understand visually that makes him pop, but from the sense of the story, he's trying to blend in, and it seems like he's really, really bad at it. I mean, I guess you could say he's, he's blending in in plain sight. That's the point, is that he's sticking out to us, but no one would think about that, like, in I the street, you know? I, I, I don't think that's an issue. I think that's an intentional choice that makes enough sense to me. But right. it, it's not saving anything, though. It's not, it's not fixing no, any of the problems not. that I have. Uh, so, thinking about the structure of this movie, though, he gets the two people like descriptions of the two people from the cab driver. And I'm just now realizing he didn't need them. He didn't need them because, because the next step is he just is like, well, I need more info. going to go to the guy who was the inter- intermediate. Yeah. He goes to the handler who gives him his jobs, who has like a Rolodex of everyone and so on. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's where he goes next. He gets like the actual names and where they live through this part. He, he did not need the, the, the cab driver, the cab driver, this information was irrelevant to him because he was just going to get a better version of it next time anyway. Yeah. Uh, but he has to break in here by pretending he's a recycling guy. Mm. Uh, which, okay, sure. Uh, he, he breaks yeah. in, the secretary's freaking out. Which, hold on, before yeah. you say that, it, it, it for the audience, I'm not going to say this every time because mm-hmm. obviously we're skipping over massive chunks, but like, you have to understand, they show him flying to the place. They show him yes. going to Home Depot, buying all of the different things that he will need, not only to kill this guy, but also to pretend to be waste management. He also, doesn't, they sh- he, doesn't he pay off two guys to buy it for him so he's not even the one in yeah. the store buying them? Yeah. I, I wasn't sure if he was paying them off or if they were like working at Home Depot and just delivered it to his car, because mm. I know that's a thing as well. Yeah, but, but it was either it way. Was like, I mean, unless he was giving them a big tip, but it looked like he was paying yeah. for the, the goods and that was like, yeah. yeah probably and then they show him sitting outside of this place long enough to wait for like a fedex guy to show up and then they show how he 
follows in the FedEx guy, how he counts how long it takes for the door to close to the office. It is ridiculously meticulous hey, the entire way through. I am more than happy for you to give these summaries. I just could not be bothered describing all no, that. No, because I'm never going to say it again. Just know <laughs> that that is happening with every single one of these scenes. Yeah, and he gets the secretary to zip tie the guy who works here, the, the lawyer, as he's referred to in the credits. Mm-hmm. And he, he he's a very different demeanor. He, he doesn't act quite as scared. He's a bit more sure of himself, even though he expects that Fassbender's going to kill him. And he eventually does with a nail gun uh, mm-hmm. and whatnot. Uh, but again, he's overly vicious in that the secretary begs for her life. And not, well, actually, she doesn't even beg for her life. She just begs that her body doesn't disappear because she wants her kids to get the life insurance. It's important that they need right. that. And I'm like, that's really dark. That She's not even saying, you know, spare me and don't kill me. She's saying, like, I'm, you're going to kill me. I'm not even going to try and convince you otherwise. But at least don't do it in a way where my kids won't get the benefit of, of life insurance right. from me. I, mm-hmm. I just thought that was... Uh, and. He, he, he goes with her to her home office, I think it is, to get her, like, coded, like, Rolodex that has, like, yeah. information on it. And then he just mm-hmm. kills her. Like, he just snaps her neck afterwards uh, with mm-hmm. no remorse. So, actually, there is one thing I do want to bring up there, is that during that opening monologue, it took, like, 20 minutes, he went through his, like, rules, his things yeah, that he has to do in order to, to be care, a killer. No empathy, all that stuff. No empathy. You have to give up everything. Like, all this stuff. But he keeps saying it. Like, every time he's going to kill somebody, he always brings it back up again. And the one that specifically stood out here is, you know, the woman's pleading, saying, hey, look, I get it. You got to kill me, but do it in this specific way. Please, this is why I thought for character growth, he would choose not to and break his rule. And that would be us setting up for where his character is going for the rest of the movie. Of course, that did not happen. However, it would have been just as easy for him to kill her just like then and there or whatever. But he does kill her in a way that makes it look like an accident. He snaps her neck, but like pushes her down the stairs. So that way it looks like she died accidentally and would be paid off. I think that's him going against the no empathy rule. I think that's him saying, okay, I care enough for that. You're right. That that then led me on to think that all of these other killings as he progresses is going to be him breaking his rules one after another. And there's a couple more of those that come up, but it doesn't really result in anything in the end. No, there's no consequences from breaking his rules. In fact, when he's, when he's going after the last guy, which is the you know the client, right? When mm-hmm. he's going after him and he does his whole thing about getting into the building, which is basically just as simple as he had food delivered, so the door was open for a second. Um, yeah. He, 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 when he's on the way there on the plane and he's done everyone else, he's killed the big guy already at this point, he's killed Tilda Swinton, we'll go back and talk about them. He's sitting on mm-hmm. the plane and he looks at this guy and goes... That's, you know, in his head, he's like, this one's risky because, you know, police and the the, the law enforcement, they care a lot more about people who have a lot of money (laughs) when they get killed. So this is painting a big target on his back. And he's like, F it, as if I'm going to do it anyway. Which, again, makes the fact that he just chooses to not kill him and walk out the building at the end even more annoying. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, like, uh, we'll get to that soon because there's a lot to say on that. Maybe you could argue there's like a cynical point being made here that mm-hmm. he doesn't like spare the cab driver who's innocent and doesn't really know anything. He doesn't spare the secretary. It's, okay, he he kind of abides by her wish technically, but like still, he could have just not killed her. Right, that was still an mm-hmm. option, right? Yeah. And maybe there's something cynical to be said that the one person he does show some, I don't even know if, don't know if you want to call it empathy, but just he makes the choice not to kill them as the not only the one percenter who's unlikable, but he's a one percenter who hired an assassin to kill someone he doesn't like. Like, mm-hmm. he's not sympathetic. He's a bad guy. <laughs> yeah. He is straight up a bad person. I mean, that's the weird thing. So out of all the people who are killed, you got cab driver, you got secretary, you got the lawyer, the client, and then Tilda Swinton and the brute guy. Florida man. Florida man. So out of all of them, obviously the brute is has to go like he is non-redeemable and he straight up is like yeah no i beat up your girl i'm glad i did it yeah i mean Tilda um, Swinton even says later on that she didn't even want to do that that was all him that wanted to torture her for information right exactly and then i think the lawyer in the scene he's in it doesn't seem like he quite deserves it because he was just the intermediary 
But then if you believe the client at the end, the client basically says, I, this is my first time doing this. I didn't know what was standard procedure for if this all goes wrong. And the lawyer said that it's standard, like to cover my ass and have you killed. So I was just doing what he said, which makes it seem like the lawyer did deserve it if we believe the client. So I don't know. It's just a lot of people being yeah. killed throughout this that or, don't seem like they really you could, deserve you it. You could also argue it's like more of a systemic thing where neither the law or the client are completely 100% to blame for the fact that he was targeted. It's just mm. kind of like he said, okay, what do you do in this situation? And the lawyer's like, well, th this is something that some people do. And the client went, yeah, I guess I'll do that then since if that's the thing people do. Yeah. So it sounds like neither one are like, oh no, we have to go after him. He's, like, he's a danger. It kind of just feels like you know, you you take the insurance on the fridge because that's what's sold at the store. <laughs> kind yeah, of. That, pretty much. That's the vibe of it. Um, and I suppose cynically, yeah, the lawyer does make more money mm -hmm. by by getting another hit job uh, ordered, which yeah, you know, I, yeah. So he he deals with the lawyer and the secretary. He mm. then goes, I think it's Florida next to get the yep. Florida man, the brute, which is basically mm -hmm. just and I actually. The one time in this movie I kind of laughed at his incompetence is he does the thing that I recently saw in another movie earlier this year, The Killing of a Chinese Bookie. I'm sure someday we'll do some John Cassavetes directed movies. Okay. But uh, he, at one point, to get past a guard dog, brings some, like, uh, like hamburgers to just sort of throw at the dog, and it sort of distracts mm -hmm. him. And effectively, here, this big guy's got a dog outside, and Michael Fassbender, not only does he bring some raw meat, he puts some, like, sleeping pills or whatever inside it. Yeah. So that the dog will go to sleep. And I kind of... The one time his incompetence or something not working kind of made me chuckle is when he repeatedly throws in different balls of meat and the dog just keeps ignoring them and not giving a yeah. shit and barking at him anyway. Uh, and yeah. I thought, okay, that's slightly amusing. Although, the dog does eat the third one. He eventually mm -hmm. does eat one. And I'm like, okay, I guess it kind of worked in the end. It just took, mm -hmm. like two minutes of my life that's not coming back i mean it's possible the dog went back for the meat after the fact true, true after he went to the first one my my thing was his narration says like oh the average pit bull is like 60 to 65 pounds and my girlfriend who was not watching this movie <laughs> i have to like she was in the room but she was not watching this movie even she looked up at that point and said there is no way in hell that dog is 65 pounds <laughs> like that dog is at least 100 well, pounds no. and he's sitting there estimating 65 i mean it, <laughs> I don't want to play devil's advocate in defense here, but he does say the very next line he has is like, this one looks like it might even be bigger. <laughs> right. Might be. Like, this is a professional, and he's sitting there saying like, oh, it might even be bigger. It's well, like, bro, that thing is twice the weight of what you're saying. But I, I think the defense of this movie is that that's the point. He is an idiot. I can't, uh, see, that's what's frustrating me is like, yes, he does these dumb things, but in the end, he comes out as successful and seemingly competent in everything he does. And I don't know what way the movie wants me to take this. It, uh, the problem is, is that it's it's funny if there's consequences and like you need the reaction on his face when he realizes, oh, shit, I'm screwed or I'm in a mm. tough spot here. And you get that a little bit when he shoots the wrong person at the end of the opening chunk. Right. But for the most part, there's very little of any consequence for when he doesn't do something well, or he does have yeah. a reaction and to something. all of his plans work out perfectly, except, like, kind of the Florida one here. Like, his entire plan about getting into the lawyer's office, the fact that this guy should know everything about this guy, about the killer, and be able to predict that he would do something like this, he just does it, and it works, and it's perfectly, like, it goes off without a hitch. Yeah, and here he just sneaks into the guy's house. The guy catches him quite quick and starts mm -hmm. fighting him, and he gets the shit beat out of him. But eventually, once they start smashing through things, um, the big guy lands ass first onto a broken table leg. So basically, he gets yeah. stabbed in the ass, which I'm like, and it's a, it's a decently well done fight scene. Like, it is good, but mm -hmm. the way I saw people like praising it online is if it's like one of the best new fight sequences. I'm like, I don't know if it's that good. I mean, I think maybe you're just watching too many like mediocre Marvel movies or something, and you've not seen yeah. a good fight scene in a while because it's not that impressive. Uh, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't hold a candle to anything in John Wick. But my favorite thing in that entire fight scene is that everything that is made of glass in that household is smashed over oh, yeah. this guy's head. You, you see this like typical glass table 
right? Mm-hmm. Which, funny enough, is exactly the same sort of table that's in Gone Girl. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> right? And I'm like, oh, they're going through that table. And sure enough, two seconds later, they go through yep. that table. There's, there's no, like, no chance there. He, you know, he does a bunch of drugs, this guy. So there's tons of, like, bongs. And he's just smashing bong after bong on this guy's head. And finally, after he's crashed through the table and, like, a few windows have gone out as well, I'm like, okay, good. We're finally out of glass. And then they start picking up the lamps and throwing them at each other. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, guys, how much glass can you find to smash on each other's heads before you finally just run out? I think and this is the part of the movie where I was definitely really checked out because by this point, I realized that I'm not, I'm just not into this guy's story or caring about his outcome. I don't, I, I don't yeah. feel any stakes for what he's doing. It's supposed to be a revenge story, but I barely know the person he's getting revenge for. And it mm-hmm. feels like there's never any, I don't know, like never any, like, yeah, there's there's opposition in the sense that this guy's fighting him and we're getting this extended fight sequence, but it never really feels like, oh, he's got something, like, something he's worried about overcoming. There's, there's never any, like, oh, yeah. it's going to be really difficult to pull off this, like, like the trick to get in here to get to this guy to kill him, like the big challenge, right? It never mm-hmm. feels like he has to overcome something it just kind of feels like he has plans they kind of fail but then they just then they succeed in the end anyway so there's never any i don't know i just uh, yeah i think that my my biggest problem is that this is kind of the climax of the movie in that in that idea of he gets overwhelmed he it doesn't feel like there's a progression where he's able to do things early on in the movie easily enough and then they get harder and harder and harder until at the end he's actually fighting for his life this point probably 45 minutes to the end is where he's fighting for his life and then the last two go off without a hitch again and so i'll be honest the end of this fight is a little anticlimactic as well he just kind of gets his gun and shoots someone it's not you know it's yeah i mean i i get it from a viewpoint of like an actual fight in that the guy who has the gun is gonna be the one who wins like i get that but yeah from a from a narrative perspective it's just lame to end it like that yeah no i mean if it was them constantly reaching for the gun and it's like okay the first to get it's going to win that's one thing but Mm -hmm. it it turns into this absurd like cartoon of them smashing stuff against each other so it just kind of feels weird to end like that i don't know it it, it didn't feel like it it felt like a big climax to me and then Mm -hmm. he goes after tilda swinton which he basically just sits there in a restaurant where she's having some fancy desserts Mm -hmm. and she realizes who it is and they (laughs) if you thought the monologues inside his head were boring Uh, now we get the monologues from tilda swinton basically saying hey isn't this life of hitman just wacky isn't it crazy how we ended up here so he sits there and listens to her drone on for a good 10 minutes monologuing about being a hitman and how if this is her final meal she best enjoy it and have a drink and yada yada and whatnot and she gives an entire like long form joke about a bear who has sex with a hunter yes well it's the hunter who keeps coming back for more and yeah. the bear keeps making this deal where hey you can either get eaten or sodomized and the mm-hmm. hunter keeps coming back trying to get revenge on the bear but keeps losing and getting sodomized and the, the punchline is the bear saying you really want to be sodomized you're into this you, yeah. you like you like getting f it's like you're not trying to kill me are you um, which, yeah, I, I don't know. Like Tilda Swinton obviously is an actor's actor, right? She she strikes mm-hmm. me as this person who loves doing monologues, who loves doing these really in depth parts, who loves to really get into her roles. But yeah. I think that's the problem for me with this scene here is that I, I just felt like I was watching like Tilda Swinton's like show reel. <laughs> yeah, it felt like it felt like inside the actor's studio. It felt to me like, and tonight we have Michael Fassbender and Tilda Swinton go ahead and they just did a monologue at each yeah. other yeah uh and then they go outside and she tries to trick him so she can stab him and he she just shoots her in the head and you find yeah. out afterwards she was holding a blade so he was right that, that there was a it was a trick it, she, she was trying to to lure him mm-hmm. into a trap and okay that's fine um i found that very anticlimactic as well if i'm honest yeah because again it's showing that he is hyper competent and good at his job but there was nothing there. We had an entire fight scene with this last guy. This one, he's just like, ah, I'm just going to shoot you before anything can happen. Yeah, maybe something to challenge. 
mm-hmm. him would would be would be good at this point. But at this to point, see if he can hold his whiskey. That's the only thing that was challenging him. Yeah, but at this point, you know, that's us. We're ready to go after the the client, and we we mm-hmm. get him watching him for a couple of days. Goes to the gym where he where he works out and gets into his building. And ultimately, the the client's like, oh, once he, I mean, he doesn't even realize who he is at first. And once he does realize who he is, because he shows him the address where the assassination was meant to take place, he's like, oh. Mm-hmm. I get who you are. And he's like, do we have a problem with me? And he's like, no, I don't have a problem with you. I, I just sort of went, followed the lawyer's advice. Uh, we're good. Like, I have no issue with you. And mm-hmm. Fastbender just kind of says, well, you can see how easy it is for me to get in here. So uh, best keep it that way. And then he just leaves. He yeah. just he just leaves. And I'm like, why are you not killing this guy? I can't think of a single narrative or thematic reason and if someone tells me it's because he's had growth, then screw you. No, he yeah. did not. I No, he did not. There was no growth. But that's the only thing I can think of. Like, the only oh. thing that makes any sort of sense is this idea that, like, right here, right now, as he's busted into this guy's place, he's decided, you know, I'm done with this life. Have a good day, sir. And just leaves. That's the only thing that makes any sort of sense. Well, I think the epilogue is suggesting that he has retired. Like, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, the lawyer says something early on where he's like, hey, you've made more than enough money that you, you can just spend the rest of your life spending it. You don't need to worry about money anymore. So just go yeah. and hide somewhere. And the final epilogue, he's just basically, he's made a drink and he gives it to his girlfriend who is now healing from her injuries and they're outside mm-hmm. sitting in the sun and he just, you know, he has that final inner monologue where he's like, no, I am one of the many. <laughs> and then that's cut to credits. That's it. And yeah. I, 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 I just, I could not have been less fulfilled by this movie. Um, the, the small moments where he's like planning something and it's kind of stylish that I was enjoying occasionally early on, even mm-hmm. that worth in the second half. Because the oh, thing yeah. is, is once I realize that you're not going to fulfill me with the actual character story or with good action even or, or whatever it may be that makes it work, then you know like at that point you're losing me and i just I, I'm, I'm i'm starting to not see the point in the meticulous parts either because now mm-hmm. i don't feel like it's building to anything and frankly i don't feel like it did build to anything i feel i feel just empty after this movie yeah no i agree that's that like i said i sat with this for three hours trying to come up with what is like the message like there's you can go back few weeks back of how many things i managed to squeeze out of fight club how many things we managed to squeeze out of seven i think that there is a lot of depth in a lot of fincher's movies i couldn't think of a single thing that this movie was trying to say in like a larger theme sort of message i don't mean that later i love panic room panic room is not a deep movie it's a it's a pretty simple you know roller coaster ride of a thriller right and i think it's really well done at that i think this fails to just be a it's, I, I think it fails to be a hitman story i think it fails to be a revenge story I, mm. I, I, and again i think panic room it again it has the same sort of setup where it's okay there's a problem we need to overcome and we're going to show mm. the steps that it takes to get there but it shows us who these characters are why we need to care about them what their wants are what their dreams are and it makes us endeared to and, them so that we care if something happens to them and you weren't even as positive on that as me, but no. I mean, I, I think you'd probably agree it's much better than this. Yeah, absolutely. That's the, I, I think that that is the least controversial opinion I've ever had on this show, <laughs> is that this is not as good as Panic Room. Oh, man. This is such a bummer. Like, I, I, it I, is. I was hoping this would be good if the stars felt aligned, and I, I, I'm just so <sighs> not happy with it. <laughs> mm-hmm. like obviously the technical qualities are there because fincher's fincher but everything yep. else i think is lacking everything else I, I just think isn't there i mean something else that's kind of drove me crazy as this movie progressed is that the soundtrack is by the smiths and well that's he, fine the well, smiths is, it's not okay by yeah the smiths. no it's by he, he it's put, by he put in a lot of songs by the smiths <laughs> you're underselling it when you say a lot of songs this movie has like at least two full albums worth of songs. I mean, I, I'll be honest. by the Smiths. I've heard of the Smiths. I don't know any of their songs, so I didn't recognize any of them. But I mean, I recognize like two or three of them. But the primary problem is, is that apologies to Smiths fans. 
<laughs> it really sounded samey after a while. Like it was the same sort of sound every single time he did this thing where he put in his iPod and it just it made it feel like every scene was just the exact same scene over and over again because all the songs even blended together and sounded the exact same. Yep. <sighs> I think Alien 3 is better than this. I haven't watched it yet. I'll get there. <laughs> it's not a good movie. Uh, although, make sure you watch the longer cut, David, though, when you do watch okay. it. It's the better one. Longer but, cut. Um, it's... It's the more. It's a definitely a more interesting film. For all its faults, mm. it, it's more interesting as as what it is. Um, like th- this is pretty low on the the Fincher list. I got to say. Um, yeah. Like I mean, not to completely throw out our opinions or anything like that for upcoming reviews, <laughs> but I would put this under that. Like, I don't th- I think I enjoyed an upcoming review more okay. than I enjoyed this. Do you know what's funny? Is I think early on, I, I realized I wasn't in love with it, and I felt like I probably would still like it more than that. But mm-hmm. after finishing it and talking about it, I think I actually agree. Although, here's a question. Is this better or worse than Benjamin Button? Oof. See, I as soon as I looked at the score list, I was like, "Crap, I'm gonna have to rank this against Benjamin Button," which is because I, I will, a problem. I will say, Benjamin Button was like 40 minutes longer, so that's a big negative mm. in its uh, yeah. in its column. But but like, t- t- I can't find any reason to want to come back to this like at all. There is nothing. I, mean, I don't want to watch in. either of them again. But at least Benjamin Button, well, I thought it was schmaltzy and saccharine and all those things. At least mm. there is a story there, even if I don't yeah. like it that much. Like, where is this? I, I, there is barely a story. I mean, I in Benjamin Button, I cared about the characters because that was the whole point. It was the the point of the movie was don't you care about these characters yeah. and how they feel about each other? This one, I mean, it's going to be maybe two, three days before every single character just vacates my mind and I'm not going to be able to tell you a thing about them. All right, well. It's time to read it, David, so... Is it? Get, get ready. Man, this is a shorter one. It is a shorter one. Uh, I, I told you! The, like, the, most of the runtime is just adding all these little details to the setups of all these plans that he's mm-hmm. doing, so it's actually very quick to talk about, because un- unless you want to go through all the details of everything he does, and yeah. I don't know if there's a point to that, unless there's something you think is particularly impressive, or how it's how it's captured, or how it's edited, or whatever, then... Not really. I, I don't think that... Yeah, like, it is a quicker discussion. Yeah. All right. Well, if I need to rate it, um, I guess it really does come down to how do I rank it against Benjamin Button? Because it's definitely not getting like above a five. I'm definitely not putting it above there, but I gave Benjamin Button a 4.5. Mm. So how do I come down on that? Do I think it's the same as Benjamin Button, better or worse? <laughs> the, I can he- almost hear the cogs turning in your mind. They are. This is this is what I need that extra half an hour in the review for for me to process through what I'm thinking here. Um, you know, just gut reaction, how I feel about it. I think I'm going to give this one below Benjamin Button. I'm going to give it a four, and the reason why is that Benjamin Button, at least in concept. It delivered on what it was trying to do. It was a schmaltzy sort of film. It felt, you know, completely romance and stuff like that. It was sento- Fine, whatever. sentimental wanking for... S- yeah, sentimental, exactly. Yeah. But this one, it felt like it was trying to set out this tense sort of thriller, and I didn't get that at all after the first, like... Well, obviously, the first 20 minutes were a crapshoot anyway, but then that little sequence of him running away from Paris, that was it. As soon as that was done, I basically lost all tension in this movie. So I'm going to give it a four. So, you know, when I was done watching it, I was thinking something like a five because I was thinking technically it's still there. It's just really mm. whiffing on everything. But honestly, talking about it, it's not done at favors. Like, I actually like it less <laughs> that yeah. I've talked about it <laughs> than I did before. So... <sighs> I mean, I'll be honest. I was coming into this hoping you could tell me the themes and message of the movie. I was really hoping for that. I, I, if I was to stretch, if I was to try, especially based on that line that he flips at the start and the end about the few and the many, is mm-hmm. that it's about having delusions of grandeur and 
in his mind he is having delusions of grandeur and but the world kind of reinforces it but uh, i don't know i think there's something thematically there that it's trying to do and i, I like i just don't think it succeeds you know i don't think yeah. it gives me a, enough uh, to paint with uh, i think i'll probably just go with a straight four for me as well uh which yeah. is the same as what i gave benjamin button uh i feel yeah. like i probably like them about the same or dislike them about the same i should say <laughs> for s- different reasons like they, they both have different problems but they probably fall about the same overall sort of right. feeling at least right, right now maybe 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 if you ask me in a month maybe i'll feel differently but yeah, that's. I I really wonder if there's ever going to be like think pieces on this movie that reveal some totally I, hidden layer or something. I, I think this is more of a disappointment though, because on paper it looked more like something I was going to enjoy, if yeah, not same. love. And absolutely, it, it did not. F- f- Especially this is um this is Michael Fassbender's first role since I think Dark Phoenix, if I remember correctly. He's been out of acting for like the past four years, and this is what he decided to come back for. Well, I'm sure on paper, doing a movie for David Fincher probably made a lot of sense to him. I mean, it would to me too, but then, <laughs> oops. And apparently, um, this is also his second in a three-picture deal, I believe. Maybe it was four-picture deal for Netflix, so... What was the first well, one or two? Uh, the Mank was the first one. Oh, Fincher, I think I meant Fassbender, sorry. No, yeah. Switched uh, over to Fincher. Yeah, there, Fincher, sorry. Sorry. yeah. Ah, fair enough, fair enough. So he's got at least one left for Netflix. Which mm-hmm. is a shame because these movies would be. I mean, admittedly, I've not felt hot in these Netflix movies, but at least they should f- be better on in the theater. Um, yeah. All right. I mean, I think it's quite clearly just not making the cut. Yeah, I. I would almost say cut your losses. I mean, if you're not feeling that, then I'm willing to give. But I, I think it's almost at that level here. I'm trying to say, like, if it's. It's borderline. I'll, I'll admit it's borderline because I, mm. I think I was kind of grasping for straws. Uh, but I think maybe the technical qualities are just enough to keep it scraped in to just cut right. from the collection and not cut your losses. Uh, but that said, though, we undercut your losses, we have it cut deep. And so I'm trying to just gauge yeah. like where on this scale this, this kind of belongs. I mean, just to give you examples of other cut your losses, uh, Uncharted, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and Expendables 4. Hmm, maybe it does belong with them. Because in, in some yeah. ways, I think those were actually easier watches than this. <laughs> yeah. Even though I think they definitely belong in the category we gave them. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, cut your losses. That's, that's, nope. all which right. is, uh, I, I agree, but yeah. That's, that's, that's rough for... Uh, uh, which we didn't do for Benjamin Button, so you've talked me into that. Okay. I mean, I'm not... I'm, I'm not saying that it's the correct choice. I'm just saying it's what I feel. No, I mean, to be fair, technically, the overall average for the movie is slightly mm-hmm. lower than Benjamin Button because you went down half a point, so technically yeah. this could be in the lower tier. But... That 0.25 is the difference between cut from the collection and cut your losses. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It's a fun experiment. Like, if all the cut your losses been under, like, a four or less... Have they all been... Uh, four, four, 3.75, uh, four, yep. Yep, they uh, all have been four or less. Okay, maybe there's some science there that we can... Uh, <laughs> maybe there's some science there that I can enter monologue about when I'm backing up my my skills later. As you're doing yoga, as you stare <laughs> out the window. Uh, he does push up on like, his fingers, like he... Like, yeah. yeah, he's such a tryhard. <laughs> like, I've seen, the you know, obviously, you do it with your fists, so you just do it with your hands, like, your palms down. Mm-hmm. Um, but, do, do it, like... There was, sorry, there was one thing that I meant to bring up, but then we just glossed over all of his airport scenes, so it never actually happened. And there was a um, lot of them. There were a lot of them. But every single time he checks in anywhere, he has a new assumed identity, and they are all famous sitcom characters. Uh, even even just the airport there's one where he's like transferring mm-hmm. money at the bank and he's like uh jefferson something jefferson yeah uh, that stuck out to me it's like george jefferson from the jeffersons and then one of them was archibald bunker yeah from uh all in the family and then uh what was one of them was um sam malone from cheers mm. and i was like oh hey he's just looping through all of them and i found that interesting at the very least but Obviously, it's just a tiny little Easter egg. It's not enough to be a movie saver. No. 
nothing saved it sadly <laughs> All right, well, there you go. Uh, next week on the show, we'll be continuing Fincher season with Gone Girl, and then there'll be one more after that with Mank, and that is the, the end of the, the season. And then after Fincher season, we're into December, which means it's Christmas time, so therefore you can look forward to the Home Alone franchise. All six of them. Oh, no. And we may have recorded all six of them already, so we know how we yeah. feel. <laughs> Not spoiling anything, but... We know, we know what that journey was like, so you'll wait to tune in for that. Um, and yeah. you're actually getting some extra episodes because uh, we wanted them all to come out before Christmas, so you're getting like two episodes a week for like three weeks mm-hmm. in December, so that you can get all the whole ones. Welcome. <laughs> yes. Uh, also worth mentioning that David uh, is about to join the Atomic Cinema Experiment. Uh, yes. You know, Tara's uh, having a bon voyage, and David is having a. Uh, uh, enter voyage <laughs> I was going to say I'm not sure what the <laughs> counter to that is no I don't know uh, but uh, our first episode is a pair on the Atomic Cinema Experiment which is you know it's a lot like this show but we just talk about sci-fi movies this show avoids sci-fi films it also avoids horror movies because it's a horror movie podcast that I do with Tim but yep. uh, now David will also be doing the science fiction movies so that'll be fun our first episode of that is going to be uh, this year's film infinity pool so if that sounds of interest mm-hmm. make sure you check it out uh if you're on youtube it's just on the channel easy enough to find if you listen to the audio feed of course just search for the atomic cinema experiment and i believe it's episode 216 will be david's first episode so yes i believe so depending on whether or not Terra's countdown is going to be before or after No, that. none of the countdowns account as a numbered episodes. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah, that's consistent. It's only Screams that that happened, and I regret doing it with Screams, but I can't change it now because it's been established. What are you talking about? Retroactive numbering is always fun for people trying to keep track of things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So, yeah, that is uh, that is the show. Uh, but, of course, you get bonus episodes and stuff over at patreon.com slash TV. If you want to support the content and keep the shows coming, keep the lights on, all that stuff. Me and David have two monthly shows. Uh, they, 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 they kind of change this month, but going forward, uh, the two monthly shows on Patreon are the Criterion Cut, which is a show where we review movies for the Criterion Collection, so it's the best of the best. You get that at $3 and up. $5 and up, you get access to the other monthly show, which is Extra Reels, where we review some of the worst movies of all time. Hopefully they're so bad they're good, but, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you can go check out that. There, there used to be a bonus episode monthly instead of Criterion Cut. Uh, that's done now, but there is a back catalogue of 13 episodes of that, which is available. So, you know, we're getting to a point now where there's a nice back catalogue of these shows, and yeah. there's bonus episodes of older shows and stuff that are there that have all built up. So if you're interested mm-hmm. in checking that stuff out, it's worth going and have a look. It is. Michael Fassbender was the one who killed the bonus episodes for this yes. show. Just making that clear. Yes, the snowman was, uh, was a hell of a time. But uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for joining us. We do appreciate it. That'll, that'll do. So thank you once again. Keep watching movies. And... The key to getting through these bad movies is just simply not giving a fuck.